Well, this evening we have a special guest speaker. Though he's not a guest of Heritage, he's been a member here for the last couple of years. Has been a blessing to us. You may have sat in under his electives. Uh, but Dr. David Croto is a professor of New Testament studies at Liberty. He's taking up a new position at Columbia International University in South Carolina beginning this fall. Dr. Croto has his Ph.D. from Southeastern in New Testament uh, studies. Uh, his wife, Anne, and their son, DJ, and daughter, Danielle, are all West Coasters, came here, lived and uh, moved here for Liberty and uh, for studies over on the East Coast, but they have just been an incredible blessing. He's a gifted teacher, a good friend. We've had many good theological discussions and uh, just good times together at Fellowship. Him and his wife actually went to Tanzania this past summer with the Tanzania team and was a blessing there in training pastors and teaching pastors. If you would... Welcome Dr. David Croto this evening. David, go ahead and come on up and welcome and uh, preach the word this evening. It's truly an honor to be here in front of you. Pastor Nathan, thank you so much for this invitation. I do appreciate it. Pray with me. Father, we ask this evening that you would bless the time that we spend in your word. I pray, God, that the truths of your word would come alive tonight in our hearts, in our minds, in our actions as we go forth from here. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be talking from Ephesians chapter 2, so you can turn there if you have your Bibles with you, or flip there in your digital devices if that's what you have. A leading Bible teacher tells a story of being at a, a college, and he's walking down the hallway of the college, and someone jumped out of a, a classroom into the hallway in front of him and said, are you saved? And he responded, saved from what? Now, he was a Christian, but it just kind of hit him when the question was asked to ask him, saved from what? And the guy looked at him, saved from what? And really thought of that question before and was really puzzled and just kind of like walked away kind of bewildered. Saved from what? Never thought of that. I think sometimes we, we use a lot of terminology in church. We talk about being saved We don't know necessarily what we're talking about when we say saved from what. Are we saved from hell? Are we saved from sin? Are we saved from ourselves? What are we saved from? And why do we need saving? I think there are many problems with the way that we do, that that evangelism takes place today in the church. Many problems with the way that it it, it happens. And Two that I want to just mention to you right now besides the one that it doesn't happen enough. The two that I want to mention to you right now is the first, I call it carrot stick evangelism. Carrot stick evangelism. Sometimes what we do when we're witnessing to someone is we we try to put something tempting out in front of them. For example, look, if you become a Christian, then your finances will be all better. I was witnessing to a guy a few months ago And he said to me, I've heard people tell me that that my relationships with other people, like a marriage or something like that, a girlfriend, will be better if I go to church and I I become a Christian. Is that true? And I said, well, it, it very well may be true, but that's not what I want to talk to you about. I don't want to hold out temptations of a a better marriage or better financial status or, or better health to an unbeliever to try to tempt him to become a Christian. I think that that shortchanges the gospel. Another problem I think we have in evangelism is what I'll call the gospelist evangelism. Like evangelism without the gospel. How could you have evangelism without the gospel? Isn't that what evangelism is? Here's what I mean. Sometimes when we're witnessing to someone, I've heard people not explain really what the gospel is, but what they, what they explain is the proper response to the gospel. In other words, 
We don't explain to them the story of God initiating with mankind coming to save us. What we explain to them is, you must repent of your sins and believe. There's a problem with that. They don't understand the word repent. They don't understand that they're a sinner. They don't understand what it means to to place their, their faith in, their trust in someone. And if you say believe in Jesus, they don't even know who he is sometimes. And so when we present the gospel, the content of the gospel is just a response, then we're actually not even giving them what the gospel is. Because technically speaking, repentance and faith is a response to the gospel, not the gospel itself. So sometimes we don't even give the gospel in evangelism. We don't even give them enough information to know what to respond to. And I think in Ephesians 2, Paul helps us understand the gospel in a way that can help us with some of these issues with the way we do evangelism today. So my main statement that I want you to walk away from tonight is that the gospel is God saving us from God, by God, and for God. The gospel is God saving us from God, by God, and for God. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the ways of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And we also formerly walked in the desires of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. You are saved by grace and and raised us together and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come, He might demonstrate the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This is not of works, lest anyone boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand in order for us to walk in them. The gospel is God saving us from God, by God, and for God. But why do we need to be saved? Why do we need to be saved? My wife recently was going through a a box of of, of stuff, and she pulled out this this gospel tract. And she just starts reading it out loud. And she's reading the information on the tract that's given to an unbeliever to help them know how to get saved. And so she reads it all out loud. And then she's done and she starts putting it away. She wasn't like reading it to me. She was just reading it out loud. And she's done and she gets ready to put it away. And I'm like, wait a minute. There was no gospel there. There was no gospel in that tract. Someone who gets that and reads it has no idea what to respond to. They know what the response is supposed to be. But they don't know what they're responding to. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. See, the reason that we need to be saved is because we're dead. This brings us back to the beginning of Scripture, back into Genesis with Adam and Eve. And I think it's important to understand how Adam and Eve fit into this because people today... They start the gospel with repent and believe, but they don't understand what we're being saved from, and it's that we're dead. Why are we dead? We're dead because we've inherited this sinful nature and this deadness from Adam and Eve when they ate of the forbidden fruit in the garden, and God said, you will die. 
and death resulted. And we are born spiritually dead. Now, a friend of mine a few years ago said, well, when it says dead, it doesn't necessarily mean dead. You know, the word there, dead, could mean sick. And I don't know if he was being sarcastic and just kind of messing with me or if he was serious. So I I decided to spend some hours researching this word for dead and hours and hours and hours, trying to find one example where it meant sick. And I never found one where it meant sick, but I think in the context of Ephesians 2.1, we see clearly what Paul means by dead. Turn uh, Look a few verses back at the end of chapter 1. Verse 20. Talks about the power of God. And it says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And it's right after that he goes into Ephesians 2.1 and he says, and we were dead. The word meaning didn't change between 120 and 2.1. It's the same word, means the same thing here. Christ was not sick on the cross. He was not just injured. He wasn't unhealthy. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. And just as Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins, we were spiritually dead. This reminds me of a story of a friend of mine. He he told me that when he was in school, he had to get a part-time job. So he ended up just trying to get any part-time job he could to put himself through school. And he got a job working for a mortician. First day in the job, he goes in. And he goes to the place where they're going to prepare the, the, the body for their funeral. And it's this really big guy on this like gurney. And he has, has to help the mortician take the body and move it over to the, to the table. And they had to do some, some work on the guy. So the, 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 his boss took a, uh, like a, now, a knife, like a scalpel. And, and he leaned in with the cold, sharp blade of the scalpel to make an incision. And as he leaned in, and the... Now remember, this is his first day in the job. As he leaned in, and as that cold steel hit the flesh of that dead body, do you know what happened? Nothing. He was dead. I told you. That's what dead means. (laughs) Nothing happens when someone's dead. You're not getting the dead part here. There's no response to dead. I was at a church once and the, and the, the pastor got up and he was trying to explain what it looks like, uh, an analogy for salvation. And he said, you know, it's like a man is lying in the street and the ambulance pulls up and the ambulance driver gets out and he walks up to the man and he says to the man, sir, I want to help you. I want to make you right. All I need is your permission. And the man says, yes. It's a problem. We weren't sick in our trespasses and sins. We weren't deathly ill in our trespasses and sins. We were dead. We can't respond. We can't respond when we're dead. The Bible is the story of God initiating with mankind to restore him into a right right relationship with God himself. We don't want to lose that story when we present the gospel to people. People don't understand what it means that God created us. They don't understand that. They don't even believe it sometimes. We have to start with God is our creator. Therefore, we are accountable to him. That can be hard to grasp. People don't understand that we're sinful. A lot of people think we're we're generally good. We're kind of born good. You know, and we learn how to do bad things through through our parents. 
But you look at the story of the Bible and it's clear. God initiates over and over and over again with mankind. The mankind that's rejecting him over and over and over again. So that's what we're saved from. We're saved from this spiritual death. We're saved from the spiritual death where we can't even respond. That's why we need to be saved. So the gospel is God saving us from God. What does that mean, saving us from God? That can sound offensive to people. Well, back in Ephesians 2, verse 3 says, And we were by nature... Children of wrath. By nature, children of wrath. That phrase, children of wrath, means we are people that are destined for wrath. We are destined for God's wrath to be poured out upon us for eternity. That's hell. That's the destiny of all of those without Christ. People have said that hell is the absence of God. Maybe the absence of a, of a good relationship with God, but I would propose to you that hell is not the absence of God's presence. Hell is the very real presence of a holy and a just and a, and a righteous and a jealous God pouring out His wrath on those who did not repent and did not believe in His Son forever and ever that's the destiny of the lost that's the urgency that we should bring with us in sharing the gospel with them so when when I say that the gospel is God saving us from God it's saving us from God's Punishment of his wrath being poured out upon us. And I think some people get confused. They think, well, the angry God is the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is a loving God. And, and one of the most popular verses in the Bible is, is John 3.16. For God so loved the world. But keep reading in that chapter. When you get to the end, you get to John 3.36. And whoever does not obey the Son has the wrath of God abiding upon them. Perfect balance. There's not really tension between God being loving and God punishing the wicked forever. So the gospel is God saving us from God. The gospel is God saving us from God and by God. By God. Ephesians 2.4 it's a wonderful verse. I get, I get goosebumps almost every time I read it when it says, but God. I mean, the condition that we are described to be in in verses 1 through 3. What does it say there? It says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, it says dead, non-responsive to God, unable to respond to God. But notice there's actually activity in this deadness in which you formerly walked. So now we have dead people walking. Okay? They're dead. They can't respond to God, but they're walking. And what's the realm of their walking? The realm of their walking is in sin. They're dead in trespasses and sins. And it talks about us living that way. The, the, our lives were characterized by sin. Not that we didn't ever do anything that was nice, but before Christ, that was what characterized our life. Sin. And then we get to verse 4. Right at the the peak of hopelessness, where our destiny of God's wrath being poured out upon us for eternity is revealed, he says, but God. And then Paul wants to explain to you the motivation of what God is about to do. God being rich, being wealthy in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. There's a little bit of redundancy there with the word love occurring a couple times because of his great love with which he loved us. Paul is piling up these terms of love to say God is ever loving. He just talked about the, the destiny of those who do not know Christ of having God's wrath poured out upon him and then he can talk about a God whose love was great because of his mercy. 
What did he do for us? Three things these verses say he did for us. He said he made us alive. He, he raised us and he seated us, seated us in the heavenly places. That first one, I think, is the overarching term here. He made us alive. See, we were dead. That's why we needed to be made alive. What does this mean, made alive? Theologians will will refer to this as the doctrine of regeneration. The idea of being made new, being recreated. We were spiritually dead, but now we are alive. There are a lot of analogies people use when they talk about salvation. I talked about one a minute ago with the the ambulance driver and and a man who was injured. Another one that I hear a lot is the one with the judge. Let's say a man comes into my house and robs my house and abuses my family, tries to murder them, injures them very severely, and the man's caught. And his day in court comes, and I'm the judge. And I say to this man, you should be punished for a long, long time. And justice needs to be served. But I'm going to serve your punishment for you. Let you go free and let you live in my house with my family. How do you think my wife would feel about that? I don't think she's going to be very happy with me putting this man in our house. Why? Well, he's been forgiven. He's been released. But he's still... A murderer. He's still a robber, an abuser. That's not the picture of salvation in Scripture. Because, see, when we're made alive and we're raised and we're seated in the heavenly places, we're changed. See, it's not even nice to the man to say, Look, you don't have to pay the penalty for your sin. Now go ahead and live in my house. That's not nice to him. That's not even good for him. Because now he's going to be living right in front of him the temptation that he can't defeat to be abusive, to murder. That's, That's not nice to him. And that's not what God does. God does not take you from death and say, well, you're not going to have to worry about being punished anymore. And now go ahead and keep living the way you were living. And maybe you can overcome some of those issues. That's not what he does. He changes us. When he makes us alive, he changes us. That's what happens at salvation. We're new. So the judge doesn't just take him and say, here, you don't have to pay the penalty for your sins. Live in, live in my house. But he changes the fundamental character and nature of that person to make it so now they have the ability, through the power of the Holy Spirit, not to do the things they don't want to do. It's different There's a change. Charles Spurgeon, when he's talking about this idea of being made alive, of of regeneration, he likens it to a pig. What does a pig eat? A pig eats slop. What's slop? Slop is the leftover old moldy food. Talking about old cheese that's got mold on it, whatever, whatever is left over from the dinner table is just put off into a bucket and then poured into the, the, the trough for the pig. It is gross and it's disgusting from our perspective. The pig, they're happy. They got the slop. There's nothing wrong with eating slop if you're a pig. But what happens at salvation is God takes a pig and makes him a man. And now the man looks at that that feeding trough with the slop in it and says, that is gross, that is disgusting. I don't want to do that anymore. But, every once in a while, we return to what we used to be. And we get down on our hands and knees and we crawl over to the feeding trough and we look at it and we go, oh, I remember those days. For some reason, looking back on 
the way things used to be when we were miserable. We, we look at that trough and we go, oh, I remember. Oh, that piece of stale moldy cheese a couple years ago. I remember that. And we get down on our hands and knees and we stick our head in the trough and we take a bite. But we're not a pig anymore. So we throw it up. Because it's gross and it's disgusting. And we get up and we walk away and we turn away. And we're going to be tempted with going back to that feeding trough. Though it makes no sense to do that. No sense at all. And sin will make you insane. It will, it will take your mind, it will take logical thinking and totally twist it. But we're disgusted by that feeding trough. That's what happens at regeneration. We're changed. We're new. God didn't just make us alive so we can continue living the same way over and over again, struggling with the same sins. The gospel is more powerful than that. I read an article a few years ago on the internet by a man who was preaching through Ephesians 2. And in the sermon he said, there are certain people that say that salvation is about the glory of God. But he goes, look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. One of the best passages on salvation. There's nothing about God's glory in Ephesians 2. I picked myself up off the floor and quickly turned to verse 7. In order that in the ages to come, he might demonstrate the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us. It's all about the glory of God. It's about God's glory. Him demonstrating his glory and what he's done. So the gospel is God saving us from him pouring out his, his wrath on us eternally by God. He saves us. He takes us who were dead and makes us alive. Makes it so we can respond to the message of the gospel as it's preached in repentance and faith. And the gospel is God saving us from God, by God, and for God. What do I mean by for God? Everyone loves to, to talk about Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Wonderful verses. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone boast. Great verse. Great verses. But sometimes, many times, we leave out verse 10. When I was teaching New Testament survey classes at Liberty, I would take a survey uh, the students by show of hands. How many of you have memorized Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? And hundreds of them would, would raise their hands. I, I probably asked this question to over a thousand students at Liberty. Hundreds would raise their hands. And then I would ask, how many of you have Ephesians 2, 10 memorized? I had one person out of a thousand raise their hand. And I told them I wasn't going to ask them to recite it. And then one girl, it was like the last time I took this survey, she raises her hand, and now I'm all tempted. Like, I'm going to ask her to recite it, see if she can. Like, can you recite it? She's like, sure. And she stood up in front of like 300 of her classmates, and she recites the verse. I was really impressed. I never met someone who actually had Ephesians 2.10 memorized. And Ephesians 2.10 is, is, is the culmination of the thought of this entire passage. It is extremely important to understand Ephesians 2.10 to understand this passage. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. That's the idea of being made alive. That's the idea of regeneration. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand in order for us to walk in them. There's a, a purpose to our salvation. And the purpose of our salvation is not, we don't have to go to hell. That's not the purpose. The purpose of our salvation is not health, wealth, good marriage. That's not the purpose. The purpose is for us to do the good works that God prepared beforehand for us to walk in. Now, people will ask me sometimes, 
these good works, are these like specific good works? Like God knew before the foundations of the world that I was going to be at the street corner with a little old lady and that I would help her across the street and that God foreordained that to happen. I don't think this passage is actually even discussing that. It, that. That could be what's going on, but I don't really think that's what's going on here. See, back in verse 2, it talks about us walking in our trespasses and sins. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. And see, that was a lifestyle. It was a lifestyle of sin. That's what characterized our life. Sin. But then we get to verse 10, and there's a word, the same word that occurred back in verse 2. Do you see it? Walked. See, formerly, before we were made alive, we walked in sin. Our life was characterized by sin. But now, we've been made alive. We've been raised from death. We've been seated in the heavenly places. And now that that's taken place, our life is characterized by good works. It's a contrast. That's what Paul is doing in verse 10. He's contrasting what our life was to what it is now. This is not you, your life might be characterized by good works. Some of the translations come across that way. That's not what's going on in this passage. It is saying that before your life was like this, but now your life is like this. Your life is characterized by good works. We are not saved by good works. But when God makes us alive, when he changes who we are, Good works will be a result. It is the purpose of him saving us to bring glory to his name through the way that we live our lives. Let us not think that we have a a ticket to get out of hell. That's not what the gospel is about. That's not what salvation is about. It is about living lives that bring honor and glory to God now because and in thanks to what he has done through Christ. So the gospel is God saving us from God. His wrath being poured out upon us for eternity. By God, he sent his son, himself God, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins, a penalty we could never pay ourselves. He changes who we are. He changes who we are. We can't do that. We can't do it because we're dead. He changes who we are. And then, because we are now new creation, because we are completely different, now our lives will be characterized by good works. Not perfection. We're still going to return to that feeding trough once in a while. As disgusting and as gross as it is, we will return to it. So how do we live this out? Well, for some of us, we are Christians and we think we we took care of the whole getting saved thing years ago, maybe when we were a kid. We got that taken care of, so it's settled. We we, we, we signed the card, we walked down the aisle, we, we did that. So we're good to go. My question is, is your life characterized by good works? Do you realize that salvation is a fundamental change in who you are? Your character, your desires changes at salvation. Is your life characterized by good works? Do you realize that you've been changed? And if not, what does that mean? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, test yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith, unless indeed you fail the test. It's good once in a while to sit back and say, is my life characterized by good works? Do I actually live a life that shows that I have been changed by the grace of God? Of God? For others of us, 
I'm hoping that when we have an opportunity, an appointed time, to share the gospel with someone, we won't shortchange it by simply saying, hey, look, if you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus, words which are totally foreign to a lot of people, have no idea what it means, repent of your sins and turn to Jesus, then you'll, you don't go to hell. Let's not present the gospel that way. Let's paint the picture of a God who created us, who loves us, that we are accountable to, and has initiated with, with mankind over and over and over again. But mankind continues to reject. Let's tell them this story and then paint the picture of what Christ has done. Don't make the gospel about a response. It's not a, just about a response. Let's not dangle in front of people this, this health and wealth idea. But if we present Jesus Christ in all his glory, that will be attractive to them when God makes them alive. That's what will be attractive to them when God changes who they are. Jesus Christ, if you lift him up and all that he's done for us, the love, the life, the death. That's what we hold up for people to see. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we think about all that you have done for us, by sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins. We are so grateful. We are so thankful that you demonstrated your love in this way. I pray, God, that we will take time to think about, to meditate upon your Son, his perfect life. Demonstrating his love by dying on the cross for us. We will take time to meditate upon that, Lord. And then live a life of thankfulness, of gratefulness that brings honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.